Kehena, Patricia, you had to a sour cook. Navy, Nahat City, Nana Hit, Ayahana Kahiri. Flup Nahari Yadik, Had City, Mohawk, Kaerwak, Kasir Leonin, Kataina, Kaerwak, Ka Irish, Ka German, Ka Dutch. My name is Patricia. I am Chukanedi. That means Glacier Bear Eagle Clan from uh, Southeast Alaska. Although I grew up in Seattle and was born and raised in Seattle, my father's lineage is in Southeast Alaska. We're from the Tlingit tribe of Huna. Um, well, it's all over Southeast Alaska, but my village is from Huna. Originally, and um, I am also Mohawk and Seneca, uh, Iroquois Hadisani, as well as um, Sierra Leonean uh, from my Caribbean side, and Taina, Erwak, and um, Irish from Montserrat Islands um, in the Caribbean, as well as um, mixed with a lot of Black um, ancestry from enslavement in Virginia, and um, as well mixed with. Uh, a little bit of German, a little bit of Dutch from slavery as well. So I'm trying to embrace that and uh, identify all of my sides, all of that history more than, more than I used to. But uh, I'm a part of Women of Color Speak Out, and I've been doing work in Seattle around social justice, human rights, civil rights, and environmental rights um, since 2010. Uh, and after a huge, horrible shooting of a Native man who was an elderly man who was a carver in Seattle. His name was John T. Williams. Uh, after the murder of him by a Seattle Police Department, by the Seattle Police Department, we did a whole evaluation of the Department of Justice, a uh, group of indigenous women and I, um, as well as one or two several indigenous men. Uh, we did a whole investigation on the Se Seattle Police Department and found practices of excessive force. Um, and uh, could not prove discrimination because of lack of data, but it has been, uh, th those efforts have become the model for a lot of uh, the police reform and also police accountability work that we've been doing in Seattle. So, and I've joined um, Women of Color Speak Out about, um, I'd say, a year ago or so? A year, yeah, and, a, a, a year and a half. A year and a half ago. Yeah, a year, a year and a half ago. And so, um, this woman, uh, she is a shaman. I wanted to share a little bit about this. She is, she could be, oh, sorry, she could be a shaman, uh -oh. but uh -oh. I'm not 100% sure. And so, um, oh, sorry. Hang on. Yeah, you got it. So, um, I wanted to kind of share a picture of her because her name is Susie Kakashla. She is a chill cat. Um, Chill cat, I don't even know what's going on. It's, it's warming up again. Oh, okay. It turned off by accident. Sorry. It turned off by accident. So, um, with that being said, what I want you all to do um, is I want you all to, uh, we're going to do a little bit of an exercise. So this is actually perfect that this is warming up. So we're going to do a little bit of an exercise. And because um, I wanted to get formal permission to do a blessing or singing, um, before uh, I started this, and I can't unfortunately do that right now, I wanted to do some like affirmations, and so um, I'm going to get more into it, but there's a lot of history of, of indigenous matrilineal cultures and their involvement within feminism, and really influencing a lot of the, the histories that we have in the U.S., and so we're going to go into that, we're going to start off with that, but we're gonna go further into it. And so I wanna read this, and I want you all to just sit it and digest this as I'm going into this uh, discussion in this lecture. And it's, um, let me see. It's uh, in regards to communities and communities that are wanting to, we're wanting to engage with indigenous people. There's a lot of historical mistrust. There's a lot of, um, especially in anthropology, any type of scholarly work. And so there's a lot of healing that indigenous people are doing to reclaim um, a lot of the history of the United States that um, has been lost and untold. And so um, with that being said, 
Uh, I wanted to share really quick, um, it was written by um, an Iroquois uh, man named Ray Fadden. He wrote um, 14 strings of purple wampum writer, uh, to purple, uh, purple wampum to writers about Indians. And so wampum was a form of currency before the United States created um, the mints and created their own currency. And it was a way that um, indigenous people, specifically Haudenosaunee, Iroquois people, were able to make treaties, make um, keep their word, as well as holding one another accountable. And so um, this piece is written to be mindful of the indigenous and settler relationships and being mindful is as we're going through this work, I want you to hold each, um, each string of this purple wampum, which is a shell, they're beautiful beads, but each, each string in your head when, as I'm saying it. So with the first string of wampum, we take away the fog that surrounds your eyes and obstructs your view, that you may see the truth concerning our people. With the second string of wampum, we pull away your impression Impression minds, the cobwebs, the nets that prevent you from dealing justice to our people. With the third piece of wampum, we cleanse our hearts of revenge, selfishness, and injustice that you may create love instead of hate. With the fourth string of wampum, we wash the blood of our people from your hands that you may know the clasp of a true friendship and sincerity. With the fifth string of wampum, we shrink your heads down to that of normal man. We cleanse your minds of the abnormal conceit and love of self that has caused you to walk blindly among the dark people of the world. With the sixth string of wampum, we remove your garments of gold, silver, and greed, that you may don the apparel of generosity, hospitality, and humanity. With this seventh string of wampum, we remove dirt that fills your ears with, so you may hear the story and truth of our people. With the A string of wampum, we straighten, we straighten your tongues of crookedness in that, in that the future you may speak the truth concerning people, indigenous people. With the ninth string of wampum, we take away the dark clouds the fate that face the sun, that its rays may purify your thoughts, that you may look forward and see America instead of backwards towards Europe. With the tenth string of wampum, we brush away the rough stones and sticks from your path, that you may walk erect as the first American whose name you have defamed and whose country you now occupy. With the eleventh string of wampum, we take away your hands, your implements of destruction, guns, bombs, fire, water, diseases, and place in, in them instead the pipe of friendship and peace that you may sow brotherly love rather than bitter hate and injustice. With this 12 string of wampum, we build you a new house with many windows and no mirrors, that you may look out and see the life and purpose of your nearest neighbor and the American Indian, the indigenous person. So um, with the 13th string of wampum, we tear down the wall of steel and stone you have built around the tree of peace, that you may take shelter beneath its branches. With this 14th string of wampum, we take the hen coop, the eagle that you have imprisoned, that this noble bird may once again fly over the sky in the United States. So uh, with that being said, I'm going to go to the next part. Um, so I want to kind of have a discussion about, so indigenous feminism. The first thing to know about indigenous feminism is indigenous feminism does not exist at all in the same way feminism does. Because indigenous did not exist until colonization, the concept of being indigenous. So because of that, feminism did not, feminism was a construct that was created after colonization. For us, that's just the way that we lived for thousands and thousands of years. And so with that being said, um, it's important to have a little bit of a discussion about what is indigenous? So uh, I wanted to share really quick um, one of my favorite definitions from Ty K. Alfred. He said, indigenous is an identity constructed, shaped, and lived in the politicized context of contemporary colonialism. The communities, clans, nations, and tribes we all call indigenous people are that indigenous to the lands they inhabit in contrast to 
and in contention with the colonial societies and states that have spread out in Europe and other centuries of empire. And so with that being said, I wanted to basically say that um, indigenous does not solely pertain to Native American people, Native people in the United States. Uh, indigenous is everywhere. Indigenous is a construct, as I said, it's a lifestyle, it's a way of living, it's a way of being. It's not a race. It's not, um, it's not any of the racial constructs that we normally associate when we hear sometimes the word indigenous. And so that being said, there's a lot of times where people can be exclusionary with that word, um, especially when we talk about other communities of color, especially when we talk about the displacement of white identified people from their own indigenous identities. And so it's important to note that we have all at one time in our lives descended from indigenous people, whether they were in Europe, whether they were in Asia, whether they were here in the United States, whether they were in other regions in the global south, they all originated somewhere along the lines, um, politically, as in indigenous people. And so um, I really want to ask everyone really quick, what do you think matriarchy is? Can anyone answer? Maybe? Uh, well, when essentially women or the hierarchical social construct has women as the, the leader or um, main uh, architect of how things in that uh, social environment operate. So women being the focal point of a lot of the, the power and the ability of self-determination self within a community and within a family. Yes, it's pretty much a lot of what it is because a lot of people most commonly associate matriarchy as uh, another version of patriarchal ways of being. Of uh, women holding more power over men or of women holding all the power and keeping that power um, and further possibly um, oppressing men, uh, people who identify as male. And for me, that's definitely not the case growing up, uh, growing around matrilineal societies. Um, me being a Klinket and Iroquois or Parishani, um, I grew up with a very different notion of matriarchy, not being that at all, but a balance. And so we'll go into that a little bit further. But um, I want to next kind of uh, show that um, during the suffrage movement, uh, when the United States was still establishing itself, and during that time, uh, a lot of Euro-American women did not have very many rights over themselves. And so I wanted to share really quick, um, there's a great book called Sisters in Spirit um, about this, and I can also, I'll go into it a little bit further later, but this is actually a lot of, this uh, really early information is about this. And so uh, really quick before I go into this, I want to acknowledge the matriarchs of my life who really taught me a lot of this work. So Luana Ross is one of my professors. She uh, is at Seos Kutne, and she taught me a lot of what I know about indigenous feminisms and the creation of it, and so, or the, the scholar work of it. So during the suffrage movement, what's very, um, oh wow, but um, what's very interesting is that during this time in upstate New York, there were six nations that created a confederacy and it's important to acknowledge this because there were hundreds of nations here in the United States before colonization, before the United, before Europeans came to this country, and we already had agreements. We already had affiliations. We already had certain types of laws, including the Great Law of Peace, uh, that really guided us as indigenous people and had been our way of being for hundreds of thousands of years. And we had a system that worked for the most part for us, and so. Um, it's really important to acknowledge that and that um, these are the six nations of the Iroquois that uh, were very much involved in a lot of the creation of, a, of Western feminism. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of how that happened, but uh, it's important to acknowledge them and it's also important to acknowledge the women and femme people who really worked directly with them. And so uh, they did a lot, a lot of their work um, towards the uh, suffrage movement was very much inspired by uh, the way of just being for, for Iroquois women. And, but it's important to also notice that Iroquois is a French word. 
It was a word that was enforced upon the Hadashanim. Um, it was not a word that they chose, but it was it's also more difficult for Europeans to, to pronounce it, so they chose Iroquois. Um, so it's very important to note that that isn't the original name. But uh, that being said, whew, it's all blurry. I don't know why. But uh, politically, um, it's important to note that politically, uh, indigenous of Haudenosaunee women and their systems, um, in comparison to Euro-American women, um, they chose their chief. Uh, Iroquois, women, Iroquois women within a matrilineal culture um, have um, held the key in political offices as clan matriarchs in charge of their families and their nuclear families. And um, they had confederacy law that ensured women's political uh, roles in the society and authority. And the decision making um, is consensus, meaning everyone has a vote, everybody has a say in all of the decisions made, which was very different at that time for uh, Euro-American women. And so a lot of Euro-American women would go into the communities, they would go and learn um, Ooh, whoa, whoa. Press oh, escape. Huh? Oh, escape? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> okay. There we go. And then so, uh, that being said, um, going back to um, kind of just different studies of different communities, um, they spent a lot of time, especially with um, a lot of uh, Onondagas and then Seneca and Mohawk, and then eventually uh, the Tuscaroras, um, they were not a part of the formal Iroquois Confederacy, but they have always been part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And so it's important to note that. And so uh, with that being said, some influences that the Haudenosaunee had amongst um, a lot of the indigenous feminism is uh, violence, the vi uh, addressing the violence against women, the ability to divorce your husbands. Um, indigenous women at that time had the ability to um, to be able to divorce their husband, to separate from them. And um, a huge part for a lot of the Euro-American women to want to divorce from their husband was so that they could get away from um, domestic violence and a lot of other uh, situations and power-based violence, especially considering that it was legal at that time to abuse Euro-American women if they're in uh, marital relationships. And so, they were looking at the Iroquois women and their ability to leave and be able to have a say over their children. Um, so rights to their children, rights to their property, um, their homes, having the ability to stay in their home after separation, not being taken out of the community, not being taken out of, away from their family and their children, um, as well as their right to vote um, and equality in um, employment uh, in their roles and responsibilities. And uh, we'll get into roles and responsibilities of, of indigenous uh, femme people and indigenous women um, in a little bit. But for me, it's very important just to know those, those little things. But um, if you want to know more about that history, uh, like I said, I definitely recommend you read Sisters in Spirit. Um, there were a lot of, there were a lot of uh, ways in much more uh, detail and length of the political history and those things like that. But we're going to go beyond just this history because it's so much focused on the relationships of Euro American and Indigenous people. I want to go beyond that to what is Indigenous feminism and so, or uh, the construct of Indigenous feminism. So, as a picture of me, I was at the Women's March. Um, I was one of the speakers in Seattle. And it was the fifth largest uh, march in the United States. And uh, my sister Zarna was also one of the speakers as well. So it was two women of color speak out members who were chosen as speakers for that. And the sign right here is that every human has rights. And for me, I argue that that every woman, I mean, every, every human has responsibilities. And so with that being said, I'll go into that a little bit more. So rights versus responsibilities. So this idea of sovereignty, um, sovereignty being one of the ultimate goals of indigenous people um, because we are not identifying, especially in the US with people who are labeled as Native American, we do not identify with our racial constructs um, on a political level. We identify with our tribal nations. There are many nations, including my own, 
Klinken and Haida for making a lot of efforts, creating our own passport cards, creating our abilities to go across the borders as our own nations, and not solely as people who are colonized under the United States. Um, the Mohawks, for example, have had a long history of that um, because they fought very hard with, with the British um, against the French. There are certain sovereignty uh, privileges that certain nations have when it comes to going across the border. But it is important to understand that unlike other communities of color, because sovereignty is the focal point um, within our territories in the United States, Asking for rights is, devalu is devaluing our sovereignty. So to say that someone has to give you the rights as a human being, has to give you civil rights, saying that that is saying that another nation has that power over you. So a lot of indigenous people are trying to focus on sovereignty and creating their own rights, creating their own laws, saying we acknowledge our laws, we acknowledge our own sovereignty versus we're asking for you to recognize our humanity. We're asking for you to do that because we're a different nation. For us to do that takes away our nationhood, our identity. And so when I also say nation, I mean territory nation. I mean uh, traditional nations and uh, traditional territories and not necessarily a border state nation, which the US is. Um, Indigenous people, uh, for example, where I'm from, we have Coast Salish communities that have different settlements during different seasons, and uh, they are gathering and living amongst different communities during those seasons, and so they can't necessarily, some communities can't necessarily say that they have borders over their territories. It's more of where they gather, where they, where they have communal um, events, and also where they do ceremony. And so that's very different from the way in which people look at uh, the United States state nations. And so um, rights being a westernized version of indigenous natural law and agreements. So when I say that, I say that indigenous people, especially when, we were when the United States Constitution was created um, and created these individualized laws, a lot of that, the Founding Fathers got much of their inspiration from indigenous people, including the Iroquois, but including other communities like Ojibwe communities. It's important to know that none of the laws in which had created our, our human rights, our equal rights, or um, uh, equality within the U.S., a lot of that comes from indigenous law. Um, Russell Means, who was a really well-known American uh, Indian movement activist, he always said that United States law is native law, and it's been chopped and copied and pasted to better fit white men versus actually fitting all people, which was the whole entire intent of much of the um, traditional indigenous laws amongst the different native nations. And so, that being said also, um, we focus on responsibilities. We focus on everybody has a role and responsibility. And as long as you are holding those responsibilities, you don't need to protect your rights as well because you're accountable for everyone else having that responsibility for other people. Um, in the United States, if we don't know our rights, we become exploited and oppressed for not knowing those rights versus we have to have uh, responsibilities to respect other people's bodies, to educate people on what they can be able to do and how they can be able to protect themselves and their bodies a responsibility to protect other people's um, homes, to re uh, respect Mother Earth. So these are other ways of thinking and focusing on collective laws, focusing on collective responsibilities and accountability for other people outside of just ourselves. And so it's a collective way of thinking. And so I really want you to maybe just think about in general, you know, why indigenous people have such more com a very complicated relationship with rights and civil rights when we talk about sovereignty and nation building, especially amongst women's rights as well. So indigenous fem knowledge. So I don't like to identify when I say, when I talk about women and when I talk about femme people, I don't like to um, associate indigenous women as women, but also femme people because indigenous people have had very con in the United States have had very very complex ways of looking at gender um, outside of the binary of male and female, woman and man. 
we uh, have had so much more uh, societies of fluidity um, where people go in and out of different gender expressions, gender roles. And so it's important to, to note that with the gender fluidity, it is not a sexuality. It is actually with indigenous people with each gender role come, with each gender identity comes a role and specific spiritual roles within the community as well. So with that being said, there's a lot of appropriation right now of two-spirit identities, mm -hmm. of people who identify as two-spirit. And I really want to emphasize, unless you are from an indigenous nation, unless you have had a relationship with, with that identity, a spiritual relationship, and have taken on specific roles within that community, you cannot identify as a two-spirited person fully. It's important to note that because in, in a lot of traditions within indigenous people, and I'm not speaking on behalf of all indigenous nations, every indigenous nation is different. Every single nation has very different views of gender identity. Every indigenous community has different views on the roles of each gender. And so, uh, but for an example, with uh, Diné communities, there's multiple genders, four genders, and um, with the, with the um, genders that are uh, influenced by both male and female um, gender and identities, uh, they are enlightened beings within the community. There are certain people who identified as two-spirit or not binary of male and female who held certain roles during transitions of huge amounts of um, tragedy, genocide. They were born into this world to be able to transition in women and men into certain roles that they need in order to survive. There are many two-spirited people who would adopt the orphans in the community. There are many two-spirited people who taught communities skills that they had lost, had been counselors for hetero marriages because they could be able to understand spiritually the male and female perspectives of things. So they held a very, very high status within the community and a lot of responsibility because of that. Helping people heal, helping people transition and go to the next phase of their community or their next phase of resistance. So a lot of history of colonization, especially during the Spanish um, conquest, there were a lot of two-spirited people that helped the community grieve, that helped them transition into um, how they can continue to thrive and survive as indigenous people. And so, um, as I said, these are spiritually wealthy people. That's, what I, that's how I like to look at it, but it's definitely more the gender. And so, uh, as well as indigenous femme knowledge is that Mother Earth is the sacred feminine, and that we look at Mother Earth as a feminine energy. And because she produces, she creates, she nurtures, she heals, she creates medicines for us. And so just like a mother would, we, we associate with that. And so global warming and climate change, in that sense, is very much an indigenous feminism, an act of patriarchy. Um, as well as uh, the colonial tourism, meaning that people coming to other countries going and exploring and viewing, but not having relationships with the lands, not having an accountability towards those areas, and not accountability for how things happen when they leave is another great example of uh, patriarchy. Um, me being Alaska native, uh, there's a lot of cruise ships that go up to Alaska. There's a lot of pollution that happens. There's a lot of uh, sexual assault that happens and harassment, uh, especially to indigenous women during this time and especially towards the land and the views of the land. And so um, this is one of my really good friends that I love a lot who, uh, they're two-spirited, their name is Geo Neptune. And so uh, they're Pasamagwadi, Pasamagwadi being um, of the Wabanaki Confederacy. So they're from the Pasamagwadi uh, nation and they're a weaver. And um, these are all pictures of Geo. I love Geo. Geo does, um, is one of, the well-known indigenous two-spirited people in our communities uh, on the East Coast uh, in Maine, and um, uh, has done a lot of amazing photo shoots and done a lot of has had a lot of award-winning weavings. And I love embracing a lot of the two-spirited people who really healed me in my life, 
who really helped me kind of guide into my own um, skills such as hunting and eating, different things like that. And so um, this is actually, as I was saying, wa uh, wampum. This is actually wampum right here around a deer's neck. That, uh, and it's wampum shell. It's a certain shell from the quahog shell that you can find in uh, the Northeast in New England. And so I want to give kind of a good example of somebody who's doing amazing work and has that uh, has that fluidity with and has that fluidity within the roles in the community as well. So uh, climate change and turn alignment. So um, really quickly, wanted to go into um, understanding. So as we said earlier with patriarchy and um, when we talk about climate justice, um, it's important to know that um, climate change affects the sovereignty and indigeneity of land. And so with these hurricanes, with different things like that, we're having people displaced and people are leaving their homes. Um, another example is the Marshall Islands. Um, right now is occupied by the US military, but because of the rising sea levels, the indigenous people of the Marshall Islands can no longer live in much of those places and they're preparing to leave their homes. So climate justice, you're taking um, away the, the sovereignty of people because of the climate refugees, um, people who are losing their identities and their lands. And so, um, uh, and also this idea of this extraction of resources, the fact that we're taking from Mother Earth, the fact that we think that all of these elements in nature, all of these different types of ways of being are resources versus these are other living beings, these are other relationships that we need to have. Um, it's this idea that there's something that are for us to take versus having relationships with. And so it's important with that to acknowledge um, that because of that, indigenous people have a different way of being. Um, it's something that I like to call the four R's. Um, and it's uh, two scholars, two um, female uh, indigenous scholars um, names this uh, the four R's, and it's a uh, kind of the four agreements, and it's pretty much um, relationship, responsibility, reciprocity, and redistribution. And so that was written by Ladonna Harris and Jacqueline Woluski, and that's something you can find online. But it's um, the four R's, and so that being said, that's relation relationality. It's important to understand that. When, we're, when indigenous people are addressing Mother Earth, addressing our relationship with Mother Earth, we're building relationships with all living beings. We're not just looking at it from a savior complex, and I need to help these things, or having a sympathetic approach to things, but actually having relationships and having accountability, um, and that leads into the responsibility aspect, that we need to have a responsibility towards uh, because we have that relationship, we now are accountable for continuing that relationship with whatever it is, with whoever it is. And then um, eventually having um, that, that necessity for reciprocity. As we continue to have these relationships, as we're asking for this knowledge or for this relationship, what are we giving back? What are we investing into that relationship? Because if we don't think about that, it becomes another extractive relationship. And then uh, lastly, the redistribution. This idea that you can't withhold or gatekeep the knowledge and the work and the relationships you have. You have to be able to share that with other people. Um, there were there are a lot of um, elders growing up for me that never taught youth or never taught people one uh, solely one student a full their full knowledge their full skill. They would teach people more than one thing so that people relied on one another to learn things so that they didn't need to work solely independently and individually but collectively. Um, and so uh, uh, another thing uh, in terms of this lack of the four R's and how it's affecting indigenous women and indigenous feminisms and um, affecting uh, Mother Earth is some of the creations of the national parks. And so. Uh, a lot of people encourage national parks and preserving wildlife, but in also some ways, it's actually taking away the sovereignty of indigenous people who originally have lived there and have, have always gathered there, have always had ceremony there. And so um, that's still a continuing issue. Um, Glacier Bay National Park is where my, my tribe is traditionally from. 
before the Ice Age, we moved down to um, what is my village of now, Huna, Alaska. But uh, uh, thousands of years ago, before the Ice Age, we lived in Glacier Bay National Park. And so um, we had very strong stories held by the indigenous women in my clan and within my village that told the stories of when we used to live there. And so when the scientists came in, we were studying the ice bridge theory, and we're um, doing work on uh, genealogy, they claim that all Native people came here during the ice bridge. And so when they created a park out of this, we, were, we had the hopes that when the ice melted, we would go back home. And so we couldn't go back home. And when we asked, why can't, why can't we go back home? They said, well, you, that's not your home. You were never there. You came here after. And so now that the ice is melting, now that they're finding a bunch of evidence and stories that our oral knowledge had always had. And much of the oral knowledge was always kept through songs, through stories, but a lot of it through the women in our communities and our matrimonial societies. And so we now have a clan house that opened up uh, last year in um, Glacier Bay where we can be able to have ceremonies, but we still cannot really legally gather there and gather foods and still be able to sustain ourselves in our homelands. Um, so uh, it's important to know also a lot of the history of the oppressive acts of colonial patriarchy since um, the indigenous uh, way of being had been dismantled on a national level or attempts had been to be dismantled. If you ask any indigenous scholar what was the mo one of the most successful forms of uh, colonizing indigenous people within the US or within North America or attempting to was enforcing patriarchy, enforcing um, Euro uh, European ways of gender norms and gender roles and living. And so um, one of the examples is the Dawes Act. I won't go into all of these because it's a lot, but these are some examples. The Dawes Act, Indian Act, Indian Reorganization Act, boarding schools, not ratifying the treaties made and not acknowledging interne international declarations such as the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. The U.S. was one of the last countries to sign off on it, but has never ratified it because it's considered unconstitutional to acknowledge any other uh, law outside or to have equally or more power than the Declaration of Independence, which is a domestic law. doesn't make any sense, but that's the U.S. <laughs> and, so, it, um, and for a very long time, there was an exclusion of indigenous women in the original Violence Against Women Act. And for a long time, there is still remaining an exclusion of Alaska Native women. Um, so it's important to note that because as the Violence Against Women Act was created, women on reservations were not protected by this law. There were laws that said that if there are intertribal, meaning like you know people within that nation, tribal nation on that reservation, there was a woman who had had violence or assault um, happen to her. If they were native, they could be able to have a whole process through VAWA, through the tribe, to go to court. But if it was a non-native person who committed this act against this woman or this person, they could not go to regular court. They could not. The only way that the government would intervene is federally, which many times gets dismissed, which many times becomes a very, very long timely uh, process for communities. And so it became very frustrating because 80% um, of Native women uh, in the United States are in relationships with non-Native people. Um, so that affects at least eight out of every 10 indigenous identified women who lives here in the United States. And so it took a very long time to include indigenous women within this law, include indigenous sovereignty, and so this is another sovereignty issue, acknowledging the U.S. and acknowledging the tribes and the tribal nations and allowing both communities, both uh, forms of power to converse with one another and be able to really truly protect indigenous women. Uh, but later on, after they acknowledged American Indian women, Alaska Native women were still not included on this act. And the reason why is because Alaska Natives, with the exception of the Simshan Nation in Matlakatla, which is southern Alaska, we had not made treaties in Alaska because we were later on um, a part of the United States. 
we were given different options and we decided we didn't want to make treaties. <laughs> and so because we didn't make treaties, because of the treatment of American Indians and other various reasons, Alaska Natives didn't have reservations because they didn't make treaties. And in some ways that became a benefit because we've allowed us to live in our traditional communities. But um, the downside uh, is, for example, is this, is that when you become, when you're, for example, when you are sexually assaulted by someone, you have to wait days and sometimes even almost a week for someone to come into your community and arrest the person who assaulted you. Police don't often frequently uh, are stationed in the community, in the villages, and um, it's very, very stressful for somebody who's been assaulted to live amongst the people in that community for days, knowing that they had already reported them, knowing that the community is personally involved with a lot of the business that goes on um, culturally and politically within families, and um, different, um, and knowing the history amongst the different families. And so a lot of people don't report to the police. A lot of people don't go to police in order to seek help because it's almost in some ways more dangerous to do so. And so a lot of people just uh, either remain quiet or they leave their communities. And Alaska being the largest, um, the largest in uh, reported rapes and sexual assaults. Uh, as well as suicide. And so that is a huge effect, hugely affects this community, especially given that Alaska Natives have such a large population within Alaska. And so um, I'm going to go into uh, boarding schools a little bit as well. Um, boarding schools being one of the most detrimental um, forms of colonization and forced assimilation within um, probably I'd say within the US history of trauma. My father was in a boarding school for 10 years in Alaska. The last boarding schools closed in Alaska around the 70s, and so he was in a boarding school from three to 13 years old. And so how many of you know about boarding schools, native boarding schools? Okay, a few of you. So in the United States, American Indians and Alaska Natives um, as well as uh, First Nations people in Canada, um, were all put in schools. Children, which is also under the under the uh, Roman statute that defines genocide within the International Criminal Court. This is one form of genocide: is that they took children legally from their parents. They criminalized the parents who did not accept to have their children taken from them at a very early age, and put them into these schools, these boarding schools that in Alaska, many of them were overseen by churches. Um, some states and some nations, they were overseen by, by the government. Um, in Canada, it was also churches as well. But um, especially in Alaska and Canada, for example, there was a huge amount of abuse, a huge amount of molestation, a huge amount of assault, a huge amount of trauma. And so, uh, including my own father's experience, and because of that, uh, leads to a huge amount of trauma that has led to addiction, mental health issues, um, identity issues, uh, cultural and political um, uh, conflicts within the communities because of that reinforcement of the culture of boarding schools um, where people don't feel comfortable speaking out about things, where people at times don't feel comfortable um, addressing issues within their community because of fears of abuse, fears of um, patriarchal type of violence, and also not being comfortable speaking their language. And so all of this was an attempt to, because after the Native Wars, after the different conflicts with Native people, the U.S. government said, well, we can't kill them all, so what are we going to do with them? And so they created the phrase, kill the Indian, save the man, which was the basis of many of the boarding schools was that we need to kill the identity that they have as indigenous people. You need to kill what language and spiritual practices they have to make them civilized people. And so in that, in that sense, many people lost their language. Many people lost, um, they lost speaking their language fluently um, as a result of this, as well as uh, lost much of their spiritual practices and eventually losing some of their sacred spiritual grounds because they no longer practice there. 
And so many people uh, to this day are still very traumatized by boarding schools, are very traumatized by relationships with religious groups and churches. So for me, I always tell people, you know, I don't, I don't feel a certain way about anybody who has religion, but I do feel a certain way about the institutions of it and the lack of history, the lack of storytelling of this history. Um, and so this is, this is very vital to indigenous, um, current indigenous issues and community and, and mental health and spiritual health of our communities. And so, as I said, it affected every single tribe in the United States and in Alaska. The last ones were in the 70s. And in fact, uh, Canada created a Truth and Reconciliation Commission around this whole entire issue. And uh, the publication was made in 2013 addressing all of the travesties and the human rights violations that happen amongst these churches and amongst these political um, systems in Canada. Uh, so, another forms of Western patriarchy, uh, this is a story of the Hershey Boys, so it's a corp Hershey ended up owning um, a boarding school in which they were training boys to be workers and be civilized. And so this is another um, example of Western patriarchy. And so, um, and these are just all external and, and um, corporation and religious influence kind of ways in which um, created the mentalities that people had amongst indigenous people and creating patriarchy amongst them. And it's important for me also to acknowledge the witch hunts um, during Europe and how that had a huge economic impact from feudalism going into uh, capitalism and other types of um, economic ways is that um, it was during a time in which women healers, uh, women uh, doctors, traditional uh, medicine people were totally ostracized and eventually dehumanized and murdered for being healers, for their feminine, divine feminine abilities within Europe. And so that created a whole atmosphere and a whole um, culture that really deeply affected the United States eventually when people came here. And so it's important to acknowledge that that trauma that happened amongst Euro, um, European women, European femme people, and that that was deeply, deeply connected with healing, with traditional um, ways of being and traditional knowledge. And so uh, understanding also that socioeconomic rights are human rights. And so a lot of people believe that this access to health care, access to education are Marxist ways of thinking, but they're actually also very traditionally indigenous ways of thinking. Um, and so this idea that uh, we can't have rights or people can't have rights in the United States or other places because it's considered socialist or all these other ideas, but these are actually ideas that came way before any type of uh, Western constructive economy. And so a good example is uh, the potlatch. So in the Northwest, we have a lot of different communities that practice what we call the potlatch. It's a Chinook word. Uh, Chinook is a, a language, a trade language that many tribes in the Northwest speak, um, I'm, since I'm from the Northwest. But uh, it means to give. And so when people would have weddings, when someone would pass, when someone was getting adopted, when somebody had a huge chieftainship or a new role within the family, they threw the family and the clan through a huge party and had all of these stories being told, had all this business such as adoption, such as mourning, and all these other things that would go about throughout the ceremony. And sometimes it would be in the old days, three days to a week long. Now it's a day or two long. They'd invite communities from all over, and every every tribe is different a little bit, um, give or take, but um, many nations would invite other tribes over and invite other families over. And if a nation was going through a famine or going through some type of issues, they would um, invite them and give them um, their abundance of whatever it was. And later on, when a community had that abundance, they were expected to give back to the people who gave to them even more. And so it's this idea that people who were giving, the chiefs who were giving, the families who were giving, the more they gave, the wealthier they became. And it was a system that worked for a very long time. And so um, and that's probably something else people would identify with other ways of being in practices. And so um, having said, kind of going a little bit further down, I wanted to go into, outside of the more political 
um, history of indigenous feminism, I wanted to go into more of the social and cultural um, and spiritual identity of indigenous feminism as well. And so uh, with the internal and external interpretations of what beauty is, what femininity is, and what desirability is. And so um, uh, external interpretations of beauty, like being that um, our bodies don't solely belong to us. So when uh, you look at this piece right here, this piece is done by a uh, family, family of mine. He's like cousin to me, uh, William Watson. He's a chief in Vancouver Island. Um, when you see, this is a Northwest artwork. And so when you see the black and red, the black symbolizing in a lot of uh, these coastal native um, traditions representing the body, the physical world and the red representing the spirit and the, the non-physical, the non-tangible world. And so it's important to note that because that's the way in which people, and did many indigenous communities, not all, but many indigenous communities um, view uh, our relationship with our bodies and our relationship with ourselves as more than just what we see on the physical outside. And so when we talk about indigenous feminisms, we, it's important for me to talk about desirability because desirability in the Western world deeply affects women in a very different way than it affects women in the indigenous communities and the ways that we, with that ways of being before colonization. And so um, this idea that your body is actually a piece of your ancestors and it's something that you're borrowing from your ancestors so you can give to your children and to the next generation. And so it's this idea that your body doesn't just belong to you, but creator and also your your ancestors. And so, um, and also meaning that the way in which we adorn ourselves isn't for desirability reasons. It's not for to look pretty or to look desirable. It's actually to represent who we are and where we come from. So for me, I have my septum pierced. And this is a traditional piercing within my tribe. It's a piercing that acknowledges your role of speaking and being an open vessel for when you speak from your ancestors. And we would wear long dangling uh, uh, hanging jewelry, either copper or shell type of jewelry. And every time we spoke, we had to be very careful of the words that we said and how they were said. And so we were holding more weight to our words. And so this doesn't have a, it doesn't have an ascetic purpose, it has a spiritual purpose for me when I speak. Um, same with the ages. Uh, a lot of people, um, being Caribbean, I, I feel a lot of ways about dreads sometimes, but um, dreadlocks, but in Alaskan culture, dreadlocks symbolized um, shamans, people who held a lot of spiritual energy. And so it's important for me to acknowledge certain things like that, how they can be appropriated, and how um, people have used tattoos, piercings, gauges, um, that are all borrowed from indigenous cultures and practices. They're all borrowed from indigenous cultures and, and practices, um, including tattooing. My cousin is a tattoo artist, traditional tattoo artist back at home. And I actually have um, some traditional tattoos that she did on me, but those were all out of representing ourselves of who we are, so that when I pass in the spiritual world, people can look at my body and know exactly where I came from, know exactly who I was, and it's telling a story about that telling a story of each thing I've gone through in my life and each role I've taken. Take, I have weaving um, tattoos on my ankles that represent that I do know how to weave and I've learned how to weave and taken on that role, that feminine role, and that role within our community. And so um, it's important to also acknowledge within the internal beauty and desirability, we were talking a little bit about spiritual desirability yesterday, but it's the fact that within the Western world, Spiritual desirability and political desirability is not necessarily acknowledged within femme people and seeked when, when we talk about beauty and desirability and talk about indigenous feminisms. And so those are roles that are really important within our community. It's when we talk about who is a desirable person, who is a spiritually enlightened person, who is doing all that work, not just in intellectually, but spiritually, emotionally, um, and also how they're relating to other people in the community. And so, I really wanted to get to this part of cultural appropriation um, of indigenous femmes and indigenous femininity and identity. Um, to me, this is something that's like really, really important to touch on, um, especially because it's such an ongoing 
perceiving issue that people really don't understand why it so deeply affects indigenous people and indigenous femmes and continues to infect the way in which we're living and the way in which we're perceived by the outside communities. And so I really wanted to address that um, because here's a great example. So this girl right here, her name is Christina Fallon. She's the daughter of the Oklahoma governor at right, that time with the governor of Oklahoma. This photo was from about two or three years ago. But um, she took that photo for band she's in. And mind you, Oklahoma has over 30 nations, indigenous nations. is one of the heavy, more heavily populated indigenous communities. So she's very well aware of those political relationships, very well aware of the appropriation of it and what it means to indigenous people. And so I wanted to read really quick um, a piece that was written by uh, one of my favorite poets, indigenous poets, her name is Joy Harjo. She wrote a piece in response to this um, through Exo Jane, that she wrote an op-ed piece. And she wrote, you can begin to see what happens when a non-native girl dons a fake plains headdress in a calculated publicity stunt. First, she assumes that everything is available for her to use in her art. It's the cultural assumption of a settler mentality that pervades American culture. It's behind the red skin mascot issue. When your people who have been disappeared from the culture into a distant past, you are frozen in imagination and chased by the U.S. cavalry, then you aren't real. Her apology was not an apology. A sarcastic lame defense. She felt that wearing the headdress would connect her deeper to a Native American culture and ask for forgiveness. She says, if we innocently adorn ourselves with our beautiful things, I mean, um, she, she asked for forgiveness for if we um, innocently adorn ourselves in your beautiful things. This statement marks another irony. She romanticizes her thoughtless act and casts herself as a naive citizen, the less innocence as the romanticists ascribe to powerful native nations. And so when Joy Harjo wrote that, it was in response to to her saying, Well, I just, you know, I was just honoring people. I was just trying to, you know, honor and respect native communities. And saying that, well, to, to say that you have the power and the right to wear something sacred like a chief's headdress is saying that we don't have that power to represent ourselves, that we don't have that space, and that we need other people to do that for us without knowing what that means to us, without knowing what our, that identity means to us. And so um, some other examples is the Kardashians over here having um, a Native birthday theme party. Um, and then also, this is uh, about like two or three years ago, uh, Victoria's Secret had a native had a woman dressed up in turquoise and a buckskin bikini with um with a headdress. And part of the reason why this is an issue is with all these costumes, with all of this idea of this hypersexualization of native women, it adds to the fact that we are three times more likely to be sexually assaulted than any other community of color in the United States. And eight times more likely to be uh, to experience relationship homicide or domestic homicide from our partners than any other community in the United States. And um, that marginalization, that um, those statistics are a lot of them are deeply affected by the fact that you have these hypersexualized people who are not indigenous representing indigenous femininity and this idea that it's just there and you can just grab it and that's you should just romanticize that moment or that experience versus having that relationship having that relationship with actual indigenous women and understanding how deeply their lives are traumatized by these patriarchal ways of, of talking about indigenous women. So this last piece over here is uh, Urban Outfitters. Urban Outfitters came out with um, a line, a Navajo-inspired line, and called uh, this the Navajo flask, this was the Navajo panties, the Navajo socks, and called it Navajo. And um, it became a huge issue because um, indigenous people, there is a law, the um, Arts and Crafts um, Act, Indian Arts and Crafts Act, that protects um, Native people and their indigenous knowledge. And so the reason why I 
talk about this, not just because I'm talking about indigenous femmes, indigenous women, it's that much of our cultures, including Navajo culture, being a matrilineal culture, those stories and our weavings, the stories and our patterns, are stories that are held by the women. The femmes in our communities are the ones who weave. They're the ones who, 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 sell the, who keep a lot of our stories, who tell their children some of those stories, who hold on to that intellectual property many times of that, the family's history, of their identity. For you to make designs saying they're Navajo, not understanding what each color means, what each uh, symbol means, not knowing what any of that means, and rewriting it as your own and calling it Navajo, that's taking away indigenous women, their knowledge, their intellect, and also their roles and their history within their communities and their sovereignty. And so I just wanted to kind of emphasize that, how, how drastic it is to our communities. And so um, this I really wanted to share. Um, different. There are so many different ways indigenous um, femmes and indigenous communities are really smashing patriarchy. But um, a lot of ways are in civil rights, for example, um, a lot of the work that goes towards, uh, and toward, towards sovereignty and also nation building amongst different communities um, is very much now led by indigenous women. Um, although Standing Rock, how many know of, you know of Standing Rock? Okay, so um, Standing Rock being one of the more recent huge uh, rights movements, but it's also not just a rights movement, it's a huge sovereignty movement, um, an environmental movement, uh, was very much led by youth and indigenous women, um, as well as many, many other histories of, of sovereignty and researching sovereignty. Another great example was the incident, um, or was the Oka crisis in Quebec um, in 1990 that was led by Mohawk women. Um, and resistance to taking back much of their um, much of their traditional lands, and then so um, another some more example is our radical reproductive justice, the revitalization of traditional birthing, traditional doula, doulas, uh, traditional ways of being. And so in uh, places like Anchorage, Alaska, they're holding um, indigenous doula and midwife conferences now, having traditional ways of uh, birthing and reproductive justice, as well as. Um, and understanding that environmental justice is a form of smashing patriarchy, understanding that when we're doing things towards environmental justice, towards treaty rights, we're also healing our relationships with Mother Earth and healing our relationships with them people. Um, uh, the missing Bawa and the missing and murdered indigenous women. I put those similar because uh, Bawa affecting the United States more and the missing murder and murdered indigenous women affecting both women in the United States and in Canada. Um, there is something in uh, British Columbia, which ran next door to Seattle and Washington State. Um, there's an area called Highway of Tears, um, where many, many indigenous women continue to go missing and, um, and are found murdered. And so uh, there's a huge fem femicide of indigenous identified femmes um, throughout North America. And so there's a lot of work that people are doing, including marches um, in Vancouver. Every year, there's a coalition of women who um, host a memorial for all of the women who were last seen or uh, last found within downtown Vancouver, acknowledging, like, directly holding that space and holding that healing for the women and sons and families within that community. Um, and then another way is divesting from DAPL, from the Dakota Access Pipeline. So uh, I was on a committee working with um, several other amazing indigenous organizers, um, divesting, we were the first, Seattle was the first city um, in the US to divest from Wells Fargo and from banks in response to uh, the extraction and the treaty violations of the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota. And so us targeting the banks, targeting money, was our way of finding um, environmental justice and finding sovereignty and um, really being able to work with allies, work with uh, urban communities also to be able to address these sovereignty issues. Um, tribal journeys, tribal canoe journeys is a west coast uh, um, journey, it's a pilgrimage that many indigenous communities go on uh, for up to two or three weeks at a time every summer. And they go basically visiting different communities and every year different 
which our nation hosts uh, those events. Um, and there's a huge cultural exchange amongst the, the dozens of different tribal nations that attend. And it creates, so it helps um, reinforce sobriety and mental health, um, as well as physical and emotional health, being on the canoe, uh, reconnecting with cultural identity, reconnecting with community, disconnecting from technology, disconnecting from a lot of the um, Western ways of living, Western ways of thinking, um, and kind of living in a much more collective way of living, even if it's only for two or three weeks allows youth, allows a lot of people to start opening up about their trauma, to start finding other ways to relieve their trauma, and allows them to have that cultural identity to heal and know who they are and where they come from, and being very proud of that. Um, and then uh, truth and reconciliation work, uh, being a lot of healing work and storytelling work to help people do healing work. And so um, I don't think that there's a perfect model for truth and reconciliation at all um, yet, uh, but I do love the theory work behind truth and reconciliation commissions. Um, the first one was built in or was established in Chile in 1990, um, and it addressed the human rights violations and genocides going on within that country. And like I said, Canada has one. The U.S. I don't know if we'll ever have a truth and reconciliation commission, <laughs> but if we did. I definitely believe that we would need to have one for indigenous, um, the indigenous colonization and genocide, the black enslavement and genocide and displacement, as well as the current war on drugs and the war on terrorism, and how that's deeply affected people incarcerated and people parents within the communities as well. And so um, there would need to be a lot of work to get to that place, but um, truth telling and, and healing work as a form of social justice is a, is a very much a new um, institutional way of dealing with um, huge human rights violations and, and acts against humanity versus going to war, going and doing um, violent actions and response. This is a way of truth telling and doing healing work um, while helping really justify um, the, the needs that communities have um, in counteracting with colonization and oppression. And so uh, genealogy research being a huge part of a uh, huge innovation within the communities, um, access to genealogy, um, me being black identified as well, um, identifying with my indigenous roots in Western Africa um, in different communities, it's very important to have, to, if you can be able to have the privilege to access that, um, I recommend it. But not everyone has those privileges, not everyone has that access because of whatever reasons of displacement, of colonization, of personal family trauma, not wanting to talk about it. Um, uh, learning about it has helped me release a lot of the internal trauma that I have. And it's been proven, um, even within the Black Panther Party, that um, people, especially women, people, women femmes who hold mitochondria, um, the mitochondria that they give to their children, you can also hold trauma in your genetics, in your DNA. And there are ways that people have worked on releasing that trauma, at least some of it, through uncovering their history, through uncovering those, those really dark parts of our history and our trauma and oppression, opening that up and grieving, um, and being able to really understand and identify what it is that your ancestors had gone through, especially the matriarchs in your life, being able to heal from that. Um, we have been doing in Seattle many grief rituals, indigenous uh, West African based grief rituals. We were taught by um, Sabonhu uh, Some uh, before she passed away. She is indigenous West African and she worked um, with some of our communities, especially people of color and indigenous identified communities on doing grief rituals um, and closed space grief rituals for people who were wanting to grieve over especially ancestral trauma, intergenerational trauma, historical trauma. Um, they needed a space to do that around other people who shared similar types of trauma so they could fully feel embraced and be allowed to fully grieve without um, being questioned or misunderstood. Um, another, another way is definitely peacekeeping circles and uh, us within um, Women of Color Speak Out have been doing a lot around nonviolent direct action. We've been very much involved in a lot of nonviolent direct action 
um, including in Standing Rock, um, being one of uh, the really great examples of spiritual justice, of spiritual uh, direct action, um, knowing that you have to spiritually prepare yourself and be in a good space emotionally, spiritually, mentally before you go in these front lines of a spiritual, a spiritual war. It's spiritual front lines. And so for you to be in a place where you can come in peace and love um, requires an immense amount of spiritual labor. Not hating the people who are oppressing you because they don't even know completely why they hate you. They don't, they don't understand in a way because of their lack of spiritual growth and their lack of spiritual understanding. And so um, we've been doing a lot of uh, healthy masculinity uh, work within indigenous uh, and people of color communities in Seattle. For example, holding um, circles and spaces around that. Um, there have been a lot of um, indigenous uh, led in Alaska uh, healthy masculinity circles as well. And also, um, Rematriate Campaign is a campaign in uh, Vancouver and British Columbia um, of really uh, emphasizing women within the community, friends within our communities that are doing amazing work uh, on a scholar level, on traditional levels, on academic, well, and also um, community and leadership levels. And so I'll show you some of the photos of that campaign as well. Um, as well as before uh, Standing Rock, there was I Don't Know More. I Don't Know More being an indigenous women-led movement for environmental justice in Canada um, was something that was incredibly successful for a lot of communities in terms of having um, acknowledgement for their environmental needs and, and the fact that their sovereignty is still something that's very important and, and sacred to those communities. And then with that being said, here is some photos that um, they did actually with me and my cousin. Um, while we go on, as I said, we go on canoe journeys every year. So this is some of our photos um, that they did of us. And so they have a whole website and a Facebook page that uplifts indigenous women and indigenous femmes and what they're doing in the community. Um, so this one is, both of these are by my cousin and I, but uh, we are warriors we may create. And, we are um, stewards of our culture. Um, this idea of instead of repatriating our identities, repatriating our, our knowledge and our intellectual property, our physical, physical property, um, we're rematriating it. So I really love that idea. And uh, this is another example of uh, some of the work that's being done in Seattle, at least in the Northwest. And so as I said, um, I started out a lot of my work with Indians for Justice. Uh, Indians for Justice was predominantly indigenous women-led. Um, these are some of my mentors, Millie Kennedy, Cindy Beach Lamar, um, and Brenda, of course, from the Billion. So, um, as well as uh, Sweetwater, um, who's very involved in community uh, throughout the U.S. Uh, if you are involved in any indigenous work, she's uh, the pretty much the leader of an I Don't Know More Washington chapter. Um, and then, uh, as well as Janice Brown and Robin Pratt, and um, Ashley as well, she was another youth that we were both doing a lot of work around um, police accountability in Seattle. And actually, what was really unfortunate to me was that after uh, the whole John T. Williams case happened um, in Washington, uh, they created a whole documentary about the fact that this case created a broader discussion within Seattle of, of the, the excessive force used against uh, black and brown people, but none of our organization was even acknowledged in that um, documentary, even though we created all of the, the research, hosted all of the rallies, and, and a lot of that is because a lot of the other people who were organizing it were very major. already uh, published a decolonizing beauty, um, as well as linguistics and how, um, especially linguistics of indigenous people and their revitalization, um, as well as whenever I've been traveling, I've been doing a lot of writing pieces wherever I've been going. And so um, it's a great way to stay in touch with me and stay in touch with women of color speak out. And um, so now we'll do a Q&A. We, we still have half an hour. Okay. We still have over half an hour. Yeah. Yes. You, you, yeah, okay. half an hour. Okay. <laughs>
You mentioned the genealogy, but can you talk about, I know that there's been a lot of resistance to the, the native resistance Thank to the you. human genome project. Maybe you could talk yes. about that. Yes. Um, so um, just a sec. Could you switch the light on so that we can see you? Okay. Yeah. Great. So there have been, yes, that's a very good point. So when it comes to genealogy, there is a lot of apprehension of indigenous people, um, especially going through uh, genome, genome and DNA extraction. Um, you being Alaskan, uh, there is the genome school at the University of Washington, which is supposed to be one of the most advanced genome schools in the country, but they're also using that to try to validate where we come from when we migrated um, versus understanding where our, our background is and what, um, how many people you know, are multi-ethnic or where you know, certain things come from in terms of you know, health-related issues, but a lot of people are using that to invalidate the uh, the arrival of indigenous people in North America, as well as using that to um, to pretty much extract information of health issues and extract information about indigenous people, um, which will affect our health insurance, our access to health care, um, as well as it's just a very, very invasive way of taking um, our, our DNA, our information, without our consent in some ways, and using that information for other things. And so, um, like, there have been historically people of color who have been, their DNA has been used to resist diseases and to resist um, other things without their consent. And so this is an ongoing issue, as well as, um, as, well as the fact that uh, when it comes to genealogy, when it comes to different things like that, uh, it isn't completely, um, no uh, genealogy or genealogist has, completely been able to pin down where indigenous uh, genes come from of North America because there's so many different, so many different uh, origins that you can't just say this person is a quarter Native American and that's what they are. And also, um, including when we talk about genealogy, there's a very politicized, uh, the whole politics of indigenous people or American Indian, Alaskan Native people in the U.S is all based on blood quantum. So it's the only race in the United States where you have to scientifically prove your race in order to identify as your race. To this day, to this day, wow. there are many tribes that have to scientifically prove I am this much blood quantum Native American in order for them to be enrolled in that tribe. For my tribe, you have to be at least one fourth, 25% Native American from that tribe to be enrolled in that tribe. Let's say you are half native from one tribe and half native from another tribe. You can only choose one tribe if it's in the U.S., you can only choose one tribe to enroll in. So that means when you have children, if you have children, your children can only enroll in that tribe. And so if you are half, they're going to be a fourth. And after that, their grandchildren are going to be even less than that. And so it is a system that has forced a political genocide of indigenous people and identities. And so, because we'll never be able to broaden our quantum, we'll never be able to expand our quantum, and it'll only get smaller. And that's like a huge issue. And so, a lot of the issues, especially between, um, I really like to go into this, especially being black and native, is there's a lot of anti-blackness around indigenous communities in terms of that um, his, history between native people and, and um, people of African descent during enslavement, before enslavement, there are always relationships with a lot of the indigenous African communities and a lot of the East Coast, you know, communities you probably already, <laughs> probably already know being here in Florida, but um, it's important to uh, know that, you know, during the time of Virginia, um, during enslavement, things like that, there was the one drop rule. The one drop rule being that if you are any drop of black, you're black. And my family, for example, uh, we identified as part Cherokee, but um, a lot of people were deeply affected by that because at that time it was illegal to be Native American in Virginia and many other states because people were being relocated on the Trail of Tears, being relocated onto reservations. And so what do you do if you live in a state where you're Native and Black and you can't exist as, either if you exist as one, you become enslaved or put into some type of oppressive system of some type of um, 
involuntary domestic work or involuntary enslavement, or being native, you can you can't even exist in that area. Period. And so um, when it came to that, there's a huge, huge issue because it 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 politically didn't allow people to be multi-ethnic. And still to this day, that culturally is a huge part of uh, a lot of multi-ethnic native issues within the U.S. The blood quantum versus one drop will be one example, but there's also many, many other examples. And so because of that, many indigenous communities um, will dismiss people who identify as multi-ethnic, or they'll have a lot of um, they'll have a lot of mistrust with people who appropriate the identities of indigenous people without any kind of accountability relationships with those communities, but wanting the benefits and access to that identity. And so like, for example, the my grandmother was a Cherokee princess, example, whenever, you know, talk to people, like, oh, my grandmother was Cherokee or a princess, whereas we didn't have hierarchies or monarchies in that sense, or we didn't have princesses, period. Um, which which didn't make any sense within the community. But it's also this idea that, oh, your culture is accessible for me. Your identity, what you identify with is accessible to me too. Versus you can't, I don't want you, well, I want you to exist as you are and I exist as I am. You know, and so, um, it's important for people to know that when we do genealogy work, there's all of these politics that really make up in the U.S. who we are racially. There's a book called The Creation of Whiteness, and it talks about, um, I'm trying to look for, I'll, I'll look up the authors and everything afterwards, but it's The Creation of Whiteness, and it talks about how white people were the first ones to racialize themselves in the U.S. before they could racialize everyone else. And at that time, they were, you know, it wasn't just all white people, it was all the, you know, people, the Anglo-European people who came in and originally occupied the area that were originally white. And then after that, um, when the newer immigrants, European immigrants came in, they weren't white. Italian, Irish, Eastern European communities, they weren't considered white. They were considered something else of a different, um, of a different tier, a different hierarchy. And then when many people of color immigrants came into the country, um, a lot of these European immigrants accepted whiteness. Um, and what uh, W.E.B. Du Bois called the uh, psychological wage, uh, he talks about a little bit in the Soul of Black Folks and a couple other books, but he talks about how people of color um, groups and non-white groups have accepted whiteness throughout history in the US in order to not experience the oppression that other communities experience. Another good example is the model minority myth of Asian American people um, accepting ideas of whiteness or concepts of whiteness to not experience the same amount of oppression as black and brown people. And so this is historically just throughout the creation of, of whiteness and the creation of a lot of race within the United States, but really emphasizing that race is not a genetic thing. It's not, um, it's not a biological thing, it's a social construct. They're all social constructs in that sense, including gender. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I do want to uh, touch on something else, but I, I also want to share some new information that's come yeah. out of genetics. Okay. Because yes, I study please. genetics, but the good, the good side of the indigenous genetic uh, findings that, that they did mm -hmm. against some of the, the will um, by, by finding um, sacred, a sacred uh, individual that they studied, they did confirm that indigenous people are descendant of a mix of Asian and, and what we would call Russian at this point, mm -hmm. um, uh, mix, but that it's its own unique DNA only identified and only found in the world in North and South America. Mm -hmm. And so all the people of North and South America, people we call Mexicans or South, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Brazilian or otherwise, these are people who are native people of yes. this country. Um, and so it is overly politicized and the concerns are valid from a DNA genetic mm -hmm. standpoint, which is why my mother will not do a DNA <laughs> test. <laughs> but um, I also wanted to point out something that you said that I thought was really uh, an interesting way to look at um, the statement of sovereignty versus rights. And I think the challenge um, blacks have had in this country has been that we, 
obviously tribally aligned to mm -hmm. Native um, culture, mm -hmm. but we have obviously fought around the statement that these are these are rights given to us by God, given mm -hmm. to us by our natural birth right, um, yet there are civilly determined rights, mm -hmm. um, obviously given and taken away based at the will of the majority. And I think it's an interesting concept to uh, push the notion of sovereignty uh, around the statement of trying to change the mindset and constructs of how America values natural given rights of people mm -hmm. as humans and mm -hmm. how do we start to um, change, I guess, maybe the, the political and legal constructs that ensure that the right of, you know, the sovereignty of each individual human is respected, mm -hmm. right? So, um, I thought that was an interesting perspective that you shared on that. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because um, I always love studying the history, especially during civil rights, of inner, um, inner community, like relationships, like the Brown Parades, and the Young Lords, the Black Panther Party, and um, especially studying, in Oak, uh, studying Oakland, you know, history of civil rights. Um, the fact that the American Indian Movement and the Black Panther Party very closely work together in terms of understanding sovereignty of Black identified people and nation building and being able to have that um, more autonomy from state violence, from government you know, violence, um, understanding how to be able to create community policing or different things like that. I wouldn't say it's completely inspired by Indigenous people, but they both inspired one another. Um, to do a lot of the work, especially with indigenous people. Um, I can easily say that we've learned a lot of uh, our dirt, more modern direct action work from black civil rights work and movements and experience that is much more culturally um, uh, understood and, and culturally practiced within a lot of you know black uh, civil rights work. And so I think it's always important for indigenous people to acknowledge that relationship. Um, because there are many times where we can have that oppression Olympics. Uh, one person or one community had it worse than another community, which is creating that continued divide mm -hmm. of, well, we all had it really bad. <laughs> We've all come through a lot of things, and we're all trying to get out of those things. Um, versus of that, that tribalist idea versus like empowering all of the communities that, that need to be lifted up, that need to have that presence and representation. Um, and so it's really interesting because I, I learned that, well, I knew Ancestry.com, for example, is actually patent, pat, patenting uh, uh, different people's DNA. So if you get your DNA done through certain companies, you have to make sure what the copyrights are, what you're consenting to when you have your DNA done. Um, whether it comes to health concerns and then providing information to health companies that will affect your, your health insurance or um, your access to health care, or whether it be your actual intellectual property of your DNA, um, which is really, to me, scary. <laughs> Especially when we're talking about you know, how people historically have done experiments on you know, indigenous people and, and um, people of color to fight things like smallpox or different things like that. Um, it's important to know um, what you're giving consent to and what is yours and how to protect you know, your own uh, body and your own intellectual property. But um, it is very interesting in terms of, of rights and responsibilities and how that, how that um, issue can create a divide within communities of color because they're not helping one another strive for certain goals because they don't share the same goals or they have different methods of going about the goals. But it's important for everyone to have a role and all of it to be equally respected because the part of patriarchy is this idea that my role is more important than yours. My theory, my my needs are more important than yours. But yeah. Is there any other questions or anything? I, I was, um, I had kind of a revelation while I was sitting here. I never thought of, um, what you said about having to be a certain percentage of blood to be a member of a tribe. I was aware of that. I didn't realize it was a law. And um, I always took it as a very personal offense that I couldn't be a member of my family's tribe. And um, I don't look like my family. I came out looking like my mom, but the rest of my family, they're dark and I'm not. 
And so it, along the lines of the rematriating and things that you're doing, my, I now have young children who are very curious about all that. Their mm -hmm. grandfather mm -hmm. sends them all the stuff. And they all have names. I don't have a name or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, my dad and the family, do you see many like white, white, white kids getting involved in things like that? Do you feel that's healthy? Do you think we should just let it go? I mean, because I just, when I couldn't be a member of the tribe, I was like, a really good question. I was a little <laughs> bit like, fine, I don't want anything to do with you anyway. Mm -hmm. like, I was offended. The exclusion. Yeah, exclusion and I never even connected that it has to do with laws and things like that. I thought it yeah. was. Yeah. So. It's very interesting about, thank you for that, because I know that mm -hmm. that's definitely within my, within my own family, it was definitely an issue as well. And um, because I hear them talk about the appropriation, like they send me stuff, I have all these things, I never wear it. Mm -hmm. I don't because I, I know how that, I'm so white. <laughs> I feel like I have no business having mm -hmm. anything to do with it. So, but anyway, I was just curious in, on how you see that and how that's perceived mm -hmm. by the community. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very, very great point. And so um, it's important for me to also know that not every tribe has blood quantum. Many, most tribes have blood quantum rules, but some have descendancy rules or family names. Like if you could prove uh, in your genetic background that you come from a certain family name or certain descendancy sometimes, depending on the tribe, like especially smaller tribes, will include descendancy and not just blood quantum. But um, a really good example of an issue of enrollment in blood quantum is that the Nooksack tribe in Washington State is continuing to have really big issues in terms of enrollment because uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs allows the tribes to dictate who's enrolled. It's not up to the U.S. government. So that could be a double-edged sword. So how, how can we include all the people who descend from us while still having enough resources for the people who, who are registered and enrolled in our tribe while being able to have people who can have access to their identities and their cultures without feeling exploited? And so it's a really difficult, like, precarious gray area that people have not... I don't think anybody's ever found a perfect way of addressing it, but um, I have a lot of, in my family, a lot of white passing people who are multi-ethnic, and for me, I just feel like when it comes to, um, when it comes to that for me, I mean, I'm, I'm native passing, um, multi-ethnic person, and so I think it's so important to be involved in knowing that history and helping encourage, you know, your family, encouraging them to know who their identity is, while still acknowledging that people are going to see me as, you know, something, something that I'm not, because we're in a very mono-ethnic culture. We're in a culture where you are what I think you look like. I think because of your hair, because of the color of your skin, because mm -hmm. of, I don't know, the, the shape of your feet, like, your, because <laughs> of your eyes, different things like that, the way you talk, including the way you talk, um, that will dictate who you are and what your status is. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is such a big issue for people who are multi-ethnic and people who have very complex identities, very layered identities. And so um, I, think, I think it's definitely good to still embrace who you are while holding, um, while holding uh, people accountable to, well, if you're going to exclude me, you can't exclude me because then uh, I know you're mixed. You know, I'm saying that like most Native people are multi-ethnic, you know, now in the United States. So to exclude someone for being white passing, um, although they have the interest in that relationship building, that interest in the accountability, and continuing to strive for um, Native people and Native issues, I think if somebody's doing that work and they're doing that self, you know, work of identity, but they're being, you know, responsible that. I can't pass as a native person, per se, so people aren't going to treat me on the street like a native person. A police officer isn't going to treat me like a native person. So holding that privilege, but using that for really good empowering things for community, for talking to white people about indigenous identities and cultural appropriation and things like that um, is so important. And so in that sense, you hold the power and a privilege that like for me, I don't like I could tell a white, oh, uh, a Euro American, a white person certain things are appropriating 
or certain things or a certain way. And, and there's just something powerful in somebody who has that, both those identities, that dualism to explain that and be accountable for that versus someone like me sharing something and it could just go out the window. Like, she's just some angry brown girl who's just, you know, who's trying to find an issue or trying to find, trying to be difficult. And so, in some ways, there's a lot of power with that. But I think having a discussion with elders and, or somebody in the community about how can I be a member of this community and what do you need from me? Um, what do you need from me in terms of my own resources that I have to offer you? Um, how can we do that? How can we build that relationship? And I'm very sure that there are elders who would be very receptive to that and be very open, mm -hmm. especially because you want to do it for your family. It's not just for your own mm -hmm. interests and self-interest. It's for your children. And it's for the fact that they need to know who they are this day and age when we have all these multi-ethnic people and all these environmental issues, all these other um, issues and isms going on. Um, it's important for people to, as many people to be involved, as many allies and as many people who uh, re are reaffirming who they are at this time in the world. At least I think so, but yeah. Thank you. I have a comment. I'm, I'm glad you said the last part about like using your privilege. I am like, so I'm, I have, I'm of Jewish descent, like all my family on my mom's side is Jewish, mm -hmm. but we grew up Christian, so nobody on our family side like claims us. <laughs> and I'm from like a family that's really separate. Like our family is like all over the place, so I don't really have like mm -hmm. family support. And I'm from Orlando, which has like no cultural identity. Like it's, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's you know came out of like, the shadow of Disney. Like Orlando is is like considered a place with place. So, and then I went to college in Alabama around all these people that were from like small town, southern places mm -hmm. that had these really strong cultural identities. And it's something that I've always felt like really lacking in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's one of the things that I'm like, I'm not, I'm not multi-ethnic, I'm not black, I'm not Latino, I'm not really Jewish, like I am, but I don't know anything about the cultural history of being Jewish because I wasn't raised that way. Like, I don't have any, like, any identity to, like, cling to. You are multi ethnic. You're <laughs> Jewish. That's an ethnicity. Yeah, I just, I've never, like, been in another group of people that identifies that way. And most people don't consider me that. Like, I have a lot of privilege because I'm very white and, like, I mean, I get really tan in the summer, but you can't tell right now. Like, and my hair is light and I have blue eyes. Like, I realize that there are things that other people go through that I haven't experienced. So, in that way, I don't feel multi-ethnic, even though, like, you know, there are things about being Jewish, like, if it came down to it, that, you know, if this were the Holocaust, I would not be considered non-Jewish. So... I know that there are things, but most people don't know that about me or, like, put those assumptions on me. So I'm, like, I don't know. I'm, I've started using my voice in terms of, like, um, speaking out for the LGBTQ community a lot more, being an advocate and, like, stepping in when people are doing shitty things. But I'm, I don't know how to be more equipped to do that for other ethnic groups. And I don't know how... Like, I mean, other than being on the internet, <laughs> which is real, like, we both have read, like, you know, we, like, follow the Mike Brown case and, like, every single police shooting, like, we follow all these stories and we're really interested and we're both social justice advocates in a lot of ways, but we don't have connection points. Mm -hmm. and, it, and we're people that want to have connection points, but we don't know what that needs to look like. I think, um, thank you for that. Yeah, that is a lot to to share mm -hmm. and to be vulnerable about. And so thank you, everybody who shared so far, especially when we talk about self-identity. It can be very touchy, especially with indigenous identity, because um, it's all from here, you know. And so, um, yeah, I honestly, I feel like a little bit jealous sometimes because I don't have any identity to like see that. That's my yes. And I don't yes. want to... Mm -hmm. be like all the white supremacists that are attaching themselves to that disenfranchised feeling. Mm -hmm. So like, I realize that there's like that space there, that that's where a lot, like if you 
listen to like any of the interviews with a lot of the, like people that are leaning towards white supremacy, a lot of them just feel disenfranchised because they have no identity. They wouldn't say that. But anyway, so that's I don't want to use that negative energy. I want to like figure out how to use it in a positive way. Well, I think definitely that relationality comes into place. The fact that you have privileges and I have privileges. We all have different types of privileges and they're all completely different and they are effective in different places and spaces. And for me, people of um, a lot of Euro and um, white descent, there's a different type of trauma. There's a different type of oppression and there's an indigenous displacement of that identity many times through the Roman conquest and all this other history. Um, a lot of people don't know who they are as indigenous people from Europe or from, you know, different areas in the Middle East or Eurasia, different areas. But um, I think coming from there and understanding, like, I'm still working on that identity and being vulnerable and, like, owning that, like, um, is, is so important in terms of being vulnerable and sharing where you're at. Um, and that's okay, you know, that's, that's, like, completely fine that you are where you are right now, and there's nothing bad about that. And so don't feel guilty about that, because there's a lot of times where we're told that something's either good or bad. You're good or bad because you don't know this, or you do know this. And I think as long as you're in a process to acknowledge exactly where you're at and where you want to go, I don't think there's anything good or bad about that work. I think that that's you being open and being authentic with yourself. And so, um, Unless there's something wrong with them, they shouldn't they shouldn't exclude you from um, especially a Europe, you know, uh, Jewish and European community shouldn't be exclusive when when you're being authentic, you know, and you're authentic. I know where where I am and where I'm not, you know, and so I think that's important as well as um, the fact that because you have that trauma, because you have that, there are other people of other different backgrounds who share similar types of trauma, you know, and as I was saying, I'm still, you know, learning my own African descendancy, and that's been displaced for me. It's a relationship that you and I have. We both share some of that trauma of that displacement of that full feeling fully something because I can't pinpoint specifically where in that family tree and that those roots. In that sense, that's you know a different type of privilege to have that. And whereas on my mother, on my father's side, I have a privilege knowing exactly what village I come from. You know, and so in, in that sense, there are a lot of privileges of identity because of that. But then um, I think when it comes to places like, like Orlando, learning more about the indigenous people and following the work that they do is a really great start. Following with the work of the people who've been forced and displaced here is a really great start. And um, if you can't start before the colonization, start from during the colonization and being like, hey, like, this is, you know, and, and knowing even that where when in which your family um, created or were put here refugees um, for whatever reason and understanding from that perspective because I'm very sure that there are other people who share that, that same type of internal kind of co internalized like conflicts like especially that's definitely I've met a lot of Jewish American people in the West we have somebody was talking about a Holocaust Center we have um, the Holocaust Center for Canada in the Northwest as well. And there are a lot of people who identify solely as Jewish American. And like, that's a part of my culture, that's part of who I am. And I might not identify with Hebrew identity specifically from the region or even the Jewish European community. And a lot of that being part of survival, you know, and part of like wanting to protect yourself from, you know, who you are as an identity, making you vulnerable to certain things. But, um, and, and in that sense, also the Holocaust, there is a Holocaust in the U.S. of Native people, and that's something that you very, very deeply share with Native people. That's a very direct relationship with the Native people here, is the Native Holocaust that we've experienced here, and having that discussion of that displacement, and I'm here because of, of these huge acts against humanity, and how can I incorporate the work that's been done since my ancestors' genocide here, because the whole entire reason we have the UN, which was the League of Nations before that, the whole reason why we have this statute that claims what genocide is, is because of the Jewish Holocaust. 
And so um, it was in response to that. Although it wasn't the first Holocaust, it created so much groundwork for why we never want anything like that to happen. Much of us never want any of that to happen again. You know, and so using that knowledge and that identity, I feel like really coming from where you are in your relationships, finding the, the similarities versus like differences, and acknowledging that nobody really has it better than anybody else or worse, or like you don't, you're not, you know, less than or better than because of where you're at. You know, you're just dealing with it, and we're all in a different form. Um, Somebody who was a mentor of mine, she would always tell me, we're all in a different form of grief. Everybody in the United States living in this country, we're in a different form of grief. We're all at different stages, dealing with it in different ways, every single race. Because to be here, um, you had some reason, whether it was uh, traumatic, or whether you were traumatizing other people, whatever, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, trauma that comes into either leaving or being displaced or resisting and still existing here. And so I feel like the U.S. has just this really, really interesting history of there's so much trauma and so much culture of us not grieving. And I really feel as though focusing on the grief first, focusing on the self-work um, is really good and important. And if you can't go through it with um, your specific communities, I think going through it from people who have similar issues but finding those commonalities and, and working through that grief together is really good as well as eventually creating those relationships with the people here. If you can't make those relationships with the people back you know, in your homelands or your family's origins, um, I always encourage people, especially like people in the Northwest for example, like the, the, the Duwamish people uh, who are indigenous from Seattle still don't have sovereignty. They still are not a recognized tribe. Um, when they, when you're not from a recognized tribe or you're not enrolled in a tribe, you're a raceless person. You cannot apply for a native scholarship. You cannot apply for native health care unless you have an enrollment number, which is like a barcode. Every single native person who's enrolled in a tribe has a number. If you don't have a number, you can't get access to anything of Native services for the most part unless you're in some um, areas where they allow descendancy or self-identity of Native people. But for example, like that's a great example, Seattle, you know, a lot of people are working at trying to reestablish the, the recognition of Duwamish people. And although they aren't Duwamish, they're trying to work at helping the people who live in the place that they call home. Because even if you don't call you know, your ancestral homes home, this is your home, so what are you going to do with your home? Because your home belongs to other people, and so it's like uh, you all share this space, and so what can you do to be able to just like acknowledge the people in the space and acknowledge their own life, lives and humanity in that space? But I hope that helps. <laughs> uh, Patty, just but do you want to? Um, I think I just would be really great with I just wanted to add a few things. So the point. No, no, no. That's totally fine. No, it's totally fine. Uh, I, I was going to add because the point that you made about being in solidarity with the native people of the land that you're on, right? Um, this land, and in the state of Florida, this land is actually known as Ijabomic, right? That's what the native people called this land, and the uh, and that nation was called the. It is. It's still called the. Original Miccosukee Seminole Nation. And right now we have the federally recognized nations of the Seminole tribe and the Miccosukee tribe, but there are also other people who are not federally recognized who, who still follow the principles of the original Miccosukee Seminole Nation. And they are not federally, um, they're not federally recognized because they don't want to be, because their elders taught them that if we take that, we then become colonized. And so mm -hmm. their That's elders... Too, we have the free nation. Right. And so their elders, um, in particular Bobby C. Billy, have been fighting continuously. And, not, and when I say fighting, what I mean is resisting. What I mean is struggling against empire and have been working for climate justice, working for, uh, working for environmental justice, not out of a you know, sense of ownership of the land, but of, 
out of the sense of service to Mother Earth and service to this land and service to their ancestors and service to their elders. So I would encourage you, you know, to look into that as like, because you were saying that you want to be allies, you've been following so many of these, you know, these um, 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 cop shootings. As an ally, one of the best things that you can do is to actually go to that community and actually ask them, in what way can I be an ally for you? I want to help, but I don't want to impose myself, right? I don't want to dominate the space. So in what way can I serve you? And when you do that, that helps to build that, that yeah. relationship that Kai was talking about in that you need to have that reciprocity also because, you know, to basically say, I'm acknowledging that I'm on your people's land and I'm acknowledging that I'm walking on this land. In what way can I serve? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you are, are displaced from your own ancestors, it at least helps to know that in some way you can at least be serving the ancestors of the land that you're on. So that, that, that could be something that might help you, whether it's yeah. the native people, whether it's the black communities, whether it's Muslim communities, whether it's, you know, whether it's um, queer and trans communities, to actually go to them and ask, what can I do? What, how, how can I help? And when it comes to being, you know, when it comes to, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter or anything else, one of the most amazing things that someone can do as an ally is to show up at that action, show up at that rally, show up at whatever it is, ask what they need. And if they say, we need you to be on the front lines in between us and the cops, that's something that we need. That's something that we need. Because when there are people who look white on the front lines, the cops will behave in a way that is very different. Yes, that's a very good point. Because it's not up to us to determine what a different nation or community needs. And it's also not everyone wants the U.S. to recognize their sovereignty because mm -hmm. there's a lot of, that's also another double-edged sword is to ask for the government to recognize yeah. you invalidates in some ways your sovereignty. Yeah, I mean, so what they're doing is that because they know that this government won't mm -hmm. recognize their sovereignty, right? So they don't want to be federally recognized because they know that this government has no respect for that in so many ways. So... So they are actually, talk, you know, trying to talk to people who are, you know, outside this government, talking to other nations to kind of get, you know, that type of recognition, that type of respect. Because when you are building relationships with people in different nations, that helps for, you know, that helps to actually have people understand who you are, where your people came from, and the fact that you're still here, right? Because we've all been told that lie, right? Oh, they're all gone. They don't exist anymore. And it's like, but they're right here. <laughs> they're right here. And this isn't Florida. This is Ichabonik. Right? Yeah. That's very important. Um, I made some videos with Bobby C. Billy. And you can actually go on YouTube and look up Bobby C. Billy's channel. Or you can actually look up uh, Ancestors and Land, Bobby C. Billy, um, uh, Water, Bobby C. Billy. And you might see those videos um, that I made with him where he is talking about the history of his people. And he's talking about the history of this land and what their culture is and why they are resisting, why they are working for climate justice, what their, uh, what their duty is mm -hmm. to their ancestors and their land and their water. Yeah. I wanted to know really quick, based off of what you just said, when I was in Standing Rock, so it was a whole huge occupation of um, lands that was treaty given through a treaty to the to the Standing Rock Lakota Sioux Nation um, and it was land that they were trying to take to build a pipeline over it. Although it wasn't the reservation land where people were living on, it was land that through a treaty belonged to that nation. And so they were trying to break that treaty to put a pipeline there and it became a huge occupation last year. Um, and it was started by youth and then continued by women and femme people. And so uh, we were able to go there last year during Thanksgiving um, to uh, Standing Rock, but what was very interesting is there's a huge amount of white allies who went. One of the biggest issues was that they pushed Native people in front of them in the front lines. And so they were there to hold space because cops from Morton County, from the predominantly uh, white communities close by neighboring the police cops, came from those areas like Bismarck, areas in Montana, um, to, to 
you know, get the people to leave, to get them off that land so they could build a pipeline, as well as policing that area. Um, the biggest issue with people, Native people, was that they wanted white allies to come in to help them hold space, to help them be in the front lines because they'd be targeted, because Native people were targeted by the police. They were throwing water, they are putting water cannons, their rubber bullets directly at Native people and Native media. Uh, completely damaging a lot of the drones. Uh, uh, they actually created a, a block, signal box, so that we could not get phone service. And every time we'd get phone service, our phones would be tapped into all these other things. And so we couldn't, we, we couldn't find ways for mainstream media to come in and be able to really broadcast what was going on. And so having those allies, having those people who are not Native, who held space and held presence in the greater U.S. was so important. And so one of the caucuses, um, there was a huge amount of uh, black activists when I was there who went to Standing Rock and we had a caucus. Um, different uh, people from different communities, uh, like the um, Black Women's Defense Organization of Dallas, um, uh, a lot of black organizers uh, uh, within Chicago, LA, New York, um, from our communities in Seattle, um, our black organizers in Seattle came as well. And we talked about it and we said, well, how will the black community, black communities, uh, be able to help be allies to indigenous communities? And we had this discussion after talking to indigenous people, after holding space. And one of the things we agreed on was we were not going to put ourselves in the front lines. We had been doing that for our own work. We were going to help with presence, we are going to help with resources, with knowledge, with representation, but it is something that we need the white allies to do for both of our communities. We cannot put ourselves in front of the front lines for another community and then ask them to do that for us when they're already doing that for their own movement. We also can't ask, you know, we can't go through that labor that other people who aren't targeted by police, who aren't targeted by state violence, um, can be able to hold privileges with that. And so we had certain discussions like that, um, and it was really good because it allowed a lot of the, the white organizers that went, you know, with our group or went in our communities, it allowed them to understand even more um, just how important within not just the black community, not just within the native community, how strong that presence of white bodies and white um, representation of allyship was. And not just, not specifically in terms of leadership, but in terms of support. Um, because uh, doing human rights, I can say that there's a huge, you know, savior complex of, of people who come in for their own self-benefit, of their own self-gratification. I'm going to come and save your community. I'm going to come, I have all of the answers, I have all the resources, I have all the money, you know, just let me come in and save you, you know. And, and um, a good book, well, a book I, you know, always loved reading that really challenged that was like, for example, Half the Sky, um, showing how, you know, local communities are funding themselves, they're being funded by outside resources, but not by NGOs that are coming in and having the savior complex and leaving and not having that relationality, that responsibility when they leave. And so um, it's important to, when you're coming and asking the community, what do you need for me? What do you need for me? As my responsibility living here, calling this place home, what do you need for me to be able to protect you and your, your space and your right to be here and live and exist here? So yeah, because it's just very easy for people to go off into the complex system and it turns into an individual, individualistic way of navigating and interacting with people. Um, we're at 808, so we're over time. Mm -hmm. I know that we definitely had one more question. Mm -hmm. Is everyone okay with us having that one more question? Um, and then, and then, and then, just one thing uh, to add is that um, we talk a great deal about allyship, how to be good allies, you know, oh, the yeah. pitfalls, all of those things. So you can actually, like, if you go to our Facebook page, watch our videos. If you go to our YouTube page. Uh, what our videos on our uh, YouTube channel, we talk a great deal about what, you know, how to be a good ally. So you can look for that, but go ahead and ask your question. Um, I wanted to know more about the boarding schools, like how did it work? Um, at boarding school, I think of, yeah, taking somebody away. And like, was it created for that purpose? I know yes. a lot of colleges were created for that purpose specifically. 
and it just resonated a lot with me about the language and just yeah like and also just general thoughts on yeah like recent immigrants and mm. you know like yeah we have our own yeah, assimilation like process and yes. right and like that's totally something that I always hear in school yeah like yeah a lot of people that don't want to speak Spanish and it, and it's like Right, for, there's that dynamic of for some, holding on to Spanish is holding on to like culturally who we mm -hmm. are. But then, of course, like Spanish was a colonized mm -hmm. language, uh, mm -hmm. taking away other people's yeah, I was just mm -hmm. talking something about that yesterday. Like, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for that. Because, um, especially on immigrant rights, you look at Im uh, immigration centers, and everybody's promoting immigration centers. They're going to help transition people working with people into American culture. And what is American culture then? You know, and I don't think it's a melting pot, I think it's a salad bowl. And a professor told me that a long time ago. It's not a melting pot, it's a salad bowl. Well it's supposed it's to be a salad bowl. Supposed to be but they, but they try want to make it, it to be a melting pot. Yeah. And it's it's a part of the culture, assimilation. You need to fit in, you need to be like everybody else or else you're gonna experience, you know, isolation and all these other things. And I like doing a lot of immigration rights work or in human rights. I've always felt really uncomfortable with the promotion of like uh, with people promoting, you know, um, promoting like specifically Western education and also right. English language. Like the the immigrant the immigrant centers, like especially on the West Coast. We can only speak on behalf of the West Coast, but the immigrant centers, you know. Oh, we're teaching English, we're teaching all these different, you know, ways of living as a, an American person, but it's like, that's another form of assimilation. Mm -hmm. It's not encouraging people to embrace their identities and their history. It's only enforcing them to embrace the European identity and descendancy. And because that's the dominant, you know, culture here is we speak English and we, we do all this type of things. And so, um, it's always very interesting when it comes to that. And the Schools, um, where, like, they're for you can look up um, boarding schools like uh, Haskell University is a native one of the native schools. It's in Kansas City. It used to be a boarding school um, originally. Uh, Chemawa in Oregon is a is a native uh, youth boarding school right now, but it's not. It's it's run by native communities, but it used to be a boarding school as well. Um, the boarding schools were intentionally built. For, and there were laws that, like I said, would criminalize Native people, Native families for not putting their children in it. Um, Hershey, Hershey Boys was another example of like orphan children who are orphans who were put into boarding schools. Um, in Alaska, my father, when he was in a boarding school, he was three years old, and he became an orphan by the time he was seven. And a lot of my uncles told me stories about why he had to still be in the boarding schools. Because during this time, the fishing industry booms a lot in Alaska. Um, and so a lot of people actually bought their children out of boarding schools in some of the areas in Alaska. And so I had uncles and aunties who told me, you know, my parents helped me get out of the boarding school through money and the resources of knowing somebody. And the people who were orphans, were still in the schools. They didn't have anybody to represent them, so they either have to run away or they have to stay in the schools. And then um, there's a lot of accounts of, uh, especially in Canada and northern parts of the U.S., that, and even in southern parts like Navajo, Diné areas, where they find children's bodies still around the school that are, aren't claimed, that were never documented and never reported. Um, and so there's a lot of intentional cover-up of the things that happened in the schools, the stories in the schools, and also the accountability. Um, Obama, during his presidency, uh, when he first started, he wanted to write a formal apology letter to Native people and Indigenous people for, for a lot of the, the effects that have happened to us in, in, um, in result to a lot of these genocidal acts. And of course it was dismissed by Senate. but. Um, a lot of people don't want to talk about that. It's not required in the U.S. to talk about it. In Seattle, uh, we passed a bill um, through Seattle City Council to enforce people within Seattle Public Schools to recognize boarding school history in their curriculum. Um, and so that was a really big first for us because um, we have such a high 
native population of people who were first generation boarding school survivors. Um, so it was important for us to, to address that because there are still people around living who, who still experience you know, a lot of the PTSD and trauma from it. Um, but there, there are ways that people can really do work like that and address that. But, um, but it's just very interesting how much it was very intentionally like not talked about, not discussed, not um, and covered up. Um, and, and I think a lot of that is because it's still a continuation of that assimilation. Because if, if you talk about the boarding schools, then you have to talk about the assimilation now, and the fact that, and the fact that this is still an assimilation of indigenous people. You know, this is still a forced assimilation of indigenous people, and the predominant communities that are forced into assimilation are the people who don't speak English as a first language, or the people who, uh, especially uh, Latinx people or indigenous people from Latin America. You know, it's the fact that they have always existed in this in these areas. They've always migrated and always exchanged and always had relationships here. You know, and so to acknowledge that and to acknowledge and embrace that is acknowledging the fact that these borders and the way in which they enforce immigration is actually a huge crime against humanity and it's actually really politically incorrect if you really want to reflect people and their history and their, their actual placement and their, their place here in the US. And so, I don't know, it's just, it's very interesting, but um, they have a couple of documentaries about boarding schools. Um, there's one called uh, the, the Canary Effect, it's on YouTube. It's a very intense documentary. You have to uh, a little bit emotionally brace yourself for that, but it's probably one of the most truthful documentaries I know that talk about serious like trauma and genocide of Native people, especially around boarding schools for sterilizations, which was a huge issue as well, amongst um, brown and black people, household rights, throughout a lot of history. Um, and then also, uh, there's also um, other communities, which is also really interesting to me too, that are being offered to be Indians, although they are you know, being offered to be American Indians, although they've also been displaced, like, you know, where you have Puerto Rico that doesn't, you know, that's being treated unfairly and treated all these certain ways, but yet they're being a part of the U.S. territory, and Hawaii being another example of that. Hawaii um, being offered treaties constantly from the U.S., even though they never sold their land properly to the United States, and it's all from ceded military occupations, they're still being told, oh, we can offer you, you know, Sign this treaty, the American Indians. And they're like, we don't want to be American Indians because we know what you do to American Indians. And you know that all the treaties have been violated. Mm -hmm. And they took the land anyway. And they took the land anyway. So yeah. yeah, we don't need to sign a treaty because we don't want it. No. Yeah, exactly. And so um, it's just it's just very interesting to see the ways in which um, the U.S. identifies Native people and um, completely invalidates other Native people and in indigeneity and placement. And, and I always look at also the history of the enslavement, you know, in different areas, especially like in Florida, for example, that there are always exchanges with, with different African communities in West Africa and throughout um, different nations in Africa with the U.S., with, with the Native tribes here, free contact. And for people to be enslaved and put here, and people were like, why are you, we, we've always traded. Why are you being put in this position, you know? And so looking at those exchanges, and um, it's just, to me, it's just very fascinating to me how people have manipulated indigeneity politically, who is indigenous, who has rights over things, versus who's, um, who's like a national nation. Like, the US has a very long history of acknowledging some nations, and not acknowledging indigenous nations. And I think that definitely has a lot to do with that idea of who's human and who's not human. The fact that, that you know, black folks are considered three-fourths of a human, native people weren't considered the same species, and it's still this complete dehumanization over like, oh, well you're not, because you're not a civilized person, you're not from Western culture, you are not human beings. And so it's it's this idea you have to force people into that assimilation for them to be human and treated as human. It's just very interesting. But yeah, I definitely recommend the canary effect. So I know it's getting late. So along those lines, uh, genesis.
Clark. I'm the Farm Worker Association of Florida and Apopka, and, and we work on immigrant issues, and a lot of our mm -hmm. community are immigrants from Haiti and, and Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, mm -hmm. Honduras, Puerto Rico. But, um, is, um, so, but, and, and on Friday, we're going to be showing a film at the CWA Hall on Edgewater Drive um, in College Park, and the film is called H2 Worker. And it's about Jamaican sugarcane workers in the United States and the conditions that 